this is on a serious topic. I'm glad Jen's with me because honestly, yeah, I could comment on the Texas law, but obviously I'm not a woman. So I think I'd rather hear from a woman about this uh, than me. But uh, we covered it a little bit yesterday, uh, last night during all this carnage and flooding, uh, the Supreme Court d uh, decided not to block, um, not to block the Texas law that basically is uh, overturning on a local level Roe versus Wade. It's draconian. It uh, does not allow abortion beyond six weeks. Obviously, I don't have a data, but maybe you do, Jen. A lot of women don't know they're pregnant at that point. Um, and basically has created this. Yeah. Bounty so so before you continue, when when someone says I'm six weeks pregnant, they're actually only four weeks pregnant. Um, they count for these things. They count the two weeks from your last period. And so they add on two weeks. So when someone says six weeks, that is only four weeks after fertilization. Um and that's going to always be pretty much an estimate based on the woman's period. So that four weeks is <laughs> um, people, a lot of women have no idea that they're pregnant. They've, they've maybe missed, missed a, a period. Some women still have a period, um, which a lot of people don't realize. In some cases, there's, there's spotting that can occur. Um, and, and the woman is pregnant and, and assumes that that's her period and that it's just like weird that month. Things can affect your your menstruation, medication you take, thing, whether you're eating enough or too much, whether you're exercising, whether you're not. So women can often assume. Uh, so just for some context there, uh, for, for folks who um, haven't been pregnant before or are men perhaps and, uh, and aren't aware of, of those kind of nuances. But so, so six weeks pregnant, so-called, is not a lot of time. A lot of women have no clue they're pregnant. But obviously, I mean, the bottom line is before we get to the politics of it, it's horrendous, um, particularly for poor, poor people. I mean, if, you, if you're if you well-to-do, you could leave Texas if you need to get an abortion. Uh, but most people cannot do that or can't get time, can't afford the flight, can't afford to travel. If they could, they can't get time off work for that kind of thing. Um, so, it is essentially criminalizing poverty, and it is also uh, really creating a bounty system on abortion because it is essential. It's it's like a most wanted sign in the old old uh, you know the wild wild west in the old days. They're saying that if you find somebody who is driving a woman to get an abortion past a certain time, if you know of the uh, abortion provider giving it, you could sue them civilly and then they will have to pay you $10,000. I cannot think of a more draconian, reckless, dangerous thing. There's already reports in Texas where more uh, right-wingers and pro-lifers are showing up outside of abortion clinics to, you know, uh, inspect who's, who's, you know, who's within the law. It is dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. Um, and honestly, the Democratic Party right now could get rid of the filibuster and enshrine Roe versus Wade into law. I mean, that they can do. President Biden can do that. Go ask. I mean, I don't want to comment on Jeffrey Tubin, but <laughs> he knows he knows law. He said it. Other, <laughs> uh, other people are saying right now they can get rid of the filibuster and, and just be done with the Supreme Court, enshrine Roe versus Wade into law. Why they're not doing that? I think we know why the Democrats do and don't do certain things. But and let's let's just call it what it is, Jen. They're going to fundraise the hell off of this. Oh uh, yeah. They're going to fundraise the hell off of this uh, under the guise of women. I mean, I think they care, but they're also going to make money off of it for the midterms and probably 2024. So yes, Merrick Garland is not exactly a progressive per <laughs> se. I don't think he'd be voting to overturn Roe versus Wade. I think we could agree to that. So. Here's 2016, and if Obama would have fought for Merrick Garland, and let's just say, let's just specify what that means. I don't know, Jen, could he have gone to Kentucky, held a rally, shaming Mitch McConnell? Could he have threatened every Republican in a swing state or a purple state or a purple district that if you deny my attorney general, excuse me, my Supreme Court justice, a hearing, I will personally campaign against you. 
personally campaign against you all over this country? Could he have galvanized women's rights, uh, women's rights groups, labor's, labor groups, Supreme Court scholars around him for speeches, uh, press conferences at the White House? Would he have won? Maybe not. Would he have a better chance of winning if he would have done that? Yes. Yes. It's the same thing Bernie Sanders said when he, if he were to become president, you know, I'm not going to first bring in Mitch McConnell and try to negotiate with him. I'm going to first bring in Mitch McConnell and say, look out the window at my army. Right? So put that back up, Colin. Let's just say for argument's sakes, Obama would have done all those things. It would have been a five to four Democrat Supreme Court before Trump won. Before Trump won. So then, moving forward, 2017. If Obama would have done that, even with Trump as president, you would have had still a five to four Supreme Court. Ruth Bader Ginsburg was still with us. The only difference would have been uh, Kennedy, the Republican, retired, and you would have swapped in Neil Gorsuch. Still a five to four Democrat Supreme Court, even under Trump. Fast forward to 2020. Uh, unfortunately, Ruth Bader Ginsburg lost. Uh, not lost, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> pa passed away. A loss for all of us, yeah. but passed away. In this scenario, I mean, give or take, who knows? Maybe they would have nominated Kavanaugh at that point. But it seems to me they wanted to nominate a woman to replace uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. In this scenario... Trump gets his second nominee and the Republicans take take a 5-4 lead. A 5-4 lead is a whole nother planet, Jen. 5-4 uh, advantage, shall we say, is a whole nother planet than 6-3 to three because we saw in many cases, including Obamacare and others, that oftentimes, even when the Republicans had a 5-4 um, advantage, that sometimes uh, Anthony Kennedy at the time, a Republican judge would come over to the liberal uh, with the liberals so that the liberals would, would uh, you know, win a majority uh, ruling. So, uh, Jen, there just seems to be no agency. It's always Susan Sarandon's fault or Jill Stein's fault or Bernie Sanders' fault. I'm going to get to the other reasons why it's not their fault. Well, but I don't know what, what your thoughts are. It's also um, controversial, of, um, I would say. Um, the Pumas, those are the, the Hillary folks, throwback to 2012, uh, no, 28, 2008, uh, Pumas. And, um, I, yeah, I, I think that it, again, this is controversial among that group, among Obama people, but, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I believe should have retired and Obama should have, um, been able to put in a, a justice at that point. And, yep. you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is uh, just, I, like, just like Stephen Breyer, by the way, should retire. Yeah. And, and you know, Justice Ginsburg did a lot of good things. She did other things that were not good. And um, in the end, the Democratic Party is so hubristic that they make this mistake over and over again. Well, for one thing, they feel like they don't have to fight for anything, as Jordan has covered. They don't truly fight. They certainly don't fight in in the way to win uh, as Demo as uh, Republicans do. Um, and so take responsibility. It's not Susan Sarandon. It's not Jill Stein. Uh, there were plenty of opportunities for Obama, for Ruth Bader Ginsburg, for all of these heroes of liberal normie Democrats. There were plenty of chances for them to actually do something to prevent this and not the all-powerful Susan Sarandon.